Yes. Welcome, yes, David. Good. We're very excited to have you back and most curious as to how the exploration will continue. Yes, okay. Now, the thing is, we've gone through Europe and we've gone through um, a bit of North Africa. Let's go a bit further south to Central Africa. Yes, um, today we'll start from there, from the history there. And if we look at the history of Central Africa, we can figure out what happened in Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, Central African Republic, Nigeria, you know, um, Congo. We will know the history of um, Peru also, of Brazil, of Venezuela, of Colombia, of Mexico, of Argentina, of Chile, of Malaysia, of Indonesia, of the Philippines, of Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, because they all follow a similar pattern. We are going to go back to when the European colonials invaded these lands and we'll start from Sudan and see what is going on there. Yes? All right, yeah? let's do it. So we'll start from Sudan. Now, when we look at Sudan, we'll soon start to understand what's going on. Now, because last time um, we, we saw that there's something strange going on in Europe. Yes, in Europe, um, the name Firan is there and um, our Pharaoh. Yes, and um, the thing is, um, um, they're at war with, with an organization or a system or a set of beliefs known as Islam or Muslims. Yes. So now when we go to Central Africa, let's say Sudan or Kenya, in that region, there's 100 million Muslims. Last time we mentioned um, North Africa, there's 100 million Muslims. There's um, another version of the Quran, the way it's written, called Warsh. So now the strange thing is, um, when we go to um, Sudan, Yes, um, when we go to Sudan, we notice that there's another version of the Quran and it, Sudan's population, you could say 50 million, not sure how many people live there. Yes, and um, because they can't make their mind up because the population statistics are not accurate and Darfur and the borders, they're not clear, but it's an estimated 100 million people within that reach of going through Central Africa all the way down to Congo. And um, they say that there is a version of the Quran there known as Duri, sometimes spelled D-O-O-R-I, Al-Duri. <clears throat> yes. So um, um, what do you call it? Um, let's have a look through this book and colonialism. And we'll notice that there's something wrong. Yes. So now um, here, um, when we see um, the Duri Quran, what we notice that um, in the Egyptian Quran, 100 million people, it says, in them is a big sin. In here, it says in them is a lot of sin, a lot. Well, that could be on the dictionary, but it's still okay. But many people are screaming, pointing out, hey, there's something wrong. Yes, there is. Yes. And um, the thing is, um, what do you call it? Yes, many non-Muslims have pointed this out, which is very important. It can't be ignored. And the Muslims try to give some, some reason that's based on the official history. Yes. And if we follow the official history, we're not going to understand it. And uh, Muslims have tried to justify it. And anybody who listens to it will say, hey, these Muslims are just talking garbage, which doesn't make any sense. And it sounds ridiculous. Yes. And um, when people compare these Qurans, now we've got three. Um, last video showed um, North Africa, 100 million people estimate in that region. And um, they've got the Warsh Quran. Now the Hafs Quran in Egypt, 100 million people in that region. And now we've got the Duri Quran, 100 million people in this region. What the hell is going on? Yes. So now um, just a bit of a reminder of the big differences between the Hafs, uh, between the Egypt and the North African Quran. What we have is the word Nakfir and Yukfar. Then we have Takuluna and Yakuluna for words. And one of them says Nunshi Zuha. Another one says Nunshi Ruha. This is what is written down in these manuscripts. And then um, what we went through in the last video and the video before, um, we presented the evidence that um, the Egyptian um, um, manuscript was placed there by the Europeans uh, and their allies and um, um, the French were involved and the North African manuscripts were placed there by the Europeans and their allies, such as the French once again. So now let's look at Sudan, because this is not about the manuscripts. We're going to go through the entire history of Central Africa and all the manuscripts. And then when we see how they were set up, because Sudan is still living in how Europe was, let's say, you know, a hundred years ago. 
So because it's a hundred years ago, it's so backwards economically or what you could say socially and other things and scientifically, then we can see what happened in Europe a hundred years ago. You see? And then we can see, let's say Colombia is 50 years behind us, but Sudan is a hundred years. It's not progressed much in a hundred years. So we can see what's going on. You see now, you see now, Raphael, why I chose this location? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So now um, um, let, let's show um, the thing is like just on, on one page, uh, just on a simple page yeah, of um, the Quran in North Africa and then the Quran in Egypt, it's underlined. You can see there's so many differences and um, what do you call it in red and many of the letters. And there is a letter there. I checked it out. Um, um, the Muslims will know it. It's the letter N. I'm enlarging it. Um, what do you call it here? to show it on the manuscript that there's these strange letter ends that don't make sense from different manuscripts from manuscript to manuscript yes and this is very important because it changes the sound and it also changes um if it's plural or if it's singular yes you see mm -hmm. um so let me just um let me just um show uh, in case that's not clear um what do you call it yes um let me just find it a bit bigger so that um, people can see it. I'm just going to get it up on Google and then um, make it bigger. Yeah, so that um, people can see it. It's the letter N. And um, the thing is, it's a, it looks like a round ball with um, a dot on the top of it. Yes, um, I'm just um, screenshotting. I'll send it. Yeah, so here it is. Um, that's what it is. So now on many manuscripts, it turns up and in other manuscripts, it's not there. So in Sudan, they're pronouncing it, but you could say in Morocco, they won't, or then they will in um, Egypt, and then they won't in, uh, once again, in Morocco, Algeria. So it's, it's like a mess. So now when you go through these, let's say these three different manuscripts, what we're going to find in the spelling, yes, which is a fact, um, people can open up these websites, differences in grammatical indicator, differences in consonant, in nouns, differences whether, are, whether they are singular, dual, plural, masculine, feminine, etc. Yes, and um, what do you call it? Yes, and um, it looks like that one word has been replaced by another because of the spelling, um, like um, uh, these certain things. Yes, so um, mm -hmm. um, now um, um, many people say because the Muslims don't know how to express themselves and they can't and they've not had a look at the history and they accept the official history and um, the Muslim history they give it a title in hadith called in Arabic called hadith and at the bottom of this page um, whoever has has done this report um, for example saying the claim that these differences are just a matter of dialect is false now the thing is now the thing is it's false because of these manuscripts so um we proved in the other two videos that these manuscripts came from Europe. Now let's look at the Sudan manuscript. Yes, the moment the Muslims realize that these are not their manuscripts, only then can they claim it's a difference of pronunciation and accent, which is the fact. But now, based on these manuscripts, these manuscripts show the differences. But are these Muslim manuscripts? We saw the two of the manuscripts in North Africa and Egypt were not placed by the Muslims. Now, Central Africa was, of course, invaded by, by the British, the French and the Italians. They still do their invasions now and then. Yeah, the Americans also, you know, they're playing around. Yeah. So what do you call it? Yes, these official Qurans, it's a, it's a known fact um, here. Um, what do you call it? Yes, they have different spellings, which could be translated into different words because there's different, different manuscripts and they have different dots, different vowels. And um, the thing is, it changes the meaning of the words. Yes. So now how do we even know what the words are? Therefore, we don't have a single Quran official manuscript today. They're all different. Yes. And if the Muslims want to dispute this, I'll just open up an official Walsh, Walsh Quran that, that the Muslims are using there. You can go through it. Here is um, chapter 50. Yes. And um, what do you call it? Um, the markings there, um, the markings like in French, it, it changes the words. It changes the sounds and everything. But once you put together all these official Qurans, then it's totally different. Yes. All of them. And then it becomes a total mess. So now um, the thing is, um, many people have done reports on this, um, you know, that there's 
many differences, thousands of differences between these Quran manuscripts. Here is one, if anybody wants to go through it. Um, the differences in, in the Egypt one and the Sudan one are Central Africa, Duri. Yes, known as the Duri. Now, let's have a look at the current population of Sudan. It's an estimated 50 million, but because of um, refugees and people who've gone out, it could be more. And um, Central Africa, there's many more Muslims, so it's about 100 million people have access to this manuscript. Now, let's look at the Chinese language. And um, um, I really don't know um, Chinese. <laughs> I'm trying to say I can speak basic Chinese. Um, why? Mm. Because I like China. Yes. <laughs> so um, um, so that's the thing. And one thing I found easy about the Chinese language is you're going to be surprised. Yes. Now, the thing is, Chinese is used by over uh, estimated one billion people, maybe one and a half billion. Yes. Maybe even two billion because um, many neighboring nations, many people study it. But this is something that nobody realizes there's basically no verb conjugation or whatever or no verb tenses or even tenses in words like um you know the past the present or the future like i came i come i'm coming i will come i did come i have come it doesn't have anything so it's like a simple language to learn believe it or not yes i found it very simple at first i found it strange yes but um i found it simple in the end so now, um, what do you call it? How do we know the tenses in the Arabic? Yes. Now, the thing is, the tenses in the Arabic, yes, you'll notice that they have strange marks, which um, turns it into an A, an E, or uh, an, a U. Yes. Or something, or an E, uh, something like that. So now, when we, um, uh, uh, we showed that um, classical Arabic was invented by the Europeans. Yes. Now, the thing is, let's go through. Um, European colonialization around the world. Yes. And um, what you will see is um, what you will see is this. Now, um, let me just um, make this clear. And um, before we go to these um, Quran manuscripts and the invention of history um, in Africa, and um, what people will notice is that um, um, the Muslims even find it hard to explain it in terminal jargon. Yes. But this letter N yeah, for example, is not used in, um, what do you call it, Palestinian Arabic. Yes, Palestinian Palestinians are one of the major groups of Arabs. Yeah, and um, it, it's used to indicate plural. Hey, what the hell is going on? Why don't they use it? But um, in Sudan, we'll find it. I'm going to show that in a minute. So, so now the thing is, this means that, um, what do you call it, somebody invented this. Yes, that if it's plural or not, to be written. Yes, and um. Um, uh, um, now, um, for um, what do you call it, Arabic teachers, we have them in Europe um, and in America, in Oxford, even in Cambridge, trying to explain the Arabic language. Um, the letter N, um, what do you call it, yes, um, it is used um, um, for pronunciation as well as for plurality or non-plurality. That um, Imagine you'll say they, um, they will come, then you will say they will come with the letter N and the end, yes? Or um, instead of come, it will be come with an end. Yes, you just add the letter N on in um, Arabic. Yes. But also, it is also used to indicate pronunciation in many words. Yes. Let's remember this. Yes. So now imagine anybody who's writing down the manuscripts. Sometimes they will write the letter N on to indicate plural. Uh, um, yes. Or otherwise, they will use it to indicate the pronunciation. You see? So people can get confused with this. Now, most right. Muslims don't know this. Yes. So that means, let's say the British come over. They brought this letter N on in many words. So in many cases, maybe it's not plural and it was just a pronunciation, but they left it there saying, ha ha, nobody uses these manuscripts. These people, were, they look dumb. They're um, sitting on the floor in tents, going around in nomads. Yes. But the world moves forward. We know that I mean, 50 years time, everywhere in the world will be more modern. So even 100 years ago, they knew that then. Yes, urbanization is a science and a process. P people from China come to study um, urban planning in England, for example. Anyway, let's look at the French language. Yes, the French language has these accents. Yes, but um, A, B, C, D, E, F, G naturally doesn't have them. For example, in England, we don't use them. So it's like um, you don't actually need them. 
yes, but they put them there. But now let's go to the other side of the world where the French were there and the British, yes, and the Spanish and everybody else and the or Portuguese, whoever you call them, they're all the friends of the Vatican. What did they do? They put these um, accents on in the Vietnamese language. Oh, by the way, they invented the Vietnamese language. They forced people to learn it or otherwise, you know, die. You understand? They set up these nation states. Mm -hmm. They set up Spanish in Argentina, po Portuguese in um, Brazil, Portuguese in Ang Angola, English in South Africa, and Afrikaans in South Africa. There's no evidence that Afrikaans was even sto spoken 150 years ago. We can't even find an Afrikaans Bible before the 20th century. Yes, in the Afrikaans language. Yes. And then when the Afrikaans were invaded, it's a long story, I'll go through it next time. Mysteriously, the army that invaded, um, a lot of it came from India. Well, anyway, let's go through this Portuguese, um, Vietnamese language. Yeah, the history is, um, they've modified it to hide the names, but it was invented by the French missionary, Alexandre de Rhodes in 17th or 18th century. Yes, and um, let's just go through who he is. Yes, and um, this just explains it all. Who is he? Did you see? Alexander Rhodes was a surprise Jesuit missionary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. So what do you call it? Yes. And um, the Jesuits were formed. Yes. What do you call it? Yes. Um, what do you call it? He was Portuguese. Notice this. Yeah. They're, and they'll say Portuguese. But the thing is, they're all united. So now let's remember. But yes, even so as here it was a Jesuit missionary who was the first French man to visit Vietnam. Yes. Yeah. Ah, oh, yes, French. So now the thing is, um, what may, um, we must remember that, um, what do you call it, the Jesuits were set up um, because, what do you call it, yes, um, Ignatius of Loyola, he was the prophet to the Muslims, the prophet of the, of the father or the Baba or the Pope. Your your um uh, your dad basically sent <laughs> sent the Jesuits. He's your dad, by the way. So you can check Jesuits online. You know, um, what do you call it? Online biography. Yes, um, it was to um, what do you call it? Yes, um, uh, for the Muslims. So now Vietnam, we can't even find their history. They've even been given a bogus language, a bogus alphabet, and of course they will say it's based on on their language, but there is no evidence of this. Yes. So now when we go, uh, when we look further and the invention of this Latin script that ended up, yes, in um, Vietnam. Yes. Who was it invented by? The Portuguese missionary. Yes. In, in the 17th century, Francisco de Pina. And um, who was Francisco de Pina? Yeah, of course, they've j changed many of the names, the dates, everything to match with the official history. Oh, of course, he was he was not a CIA agent, but he was a Jesuit agent. Yes. Are you beginning to see where we're getting at here now? Definitely. Yes. And I was so just a bit same... surprised that is even in Encyc Encyclopedica Britannica that they totally admit this. So this is not. Yeah, this is. Uh, as uh, I will explain gets. to you now. I will explain to you why it's hard to hide it, because the Vietnamese people, they're alive. They're real. They're humans. They're here today and they're saying, hey, we didn't develop or invent this language. We didn't develop this writing system. We had our different dialects and everything else. So they are going to say this. Yes. So they remember. Yes. Same like in the Arabic countries, but because of religion, many people will deny it. But um, the thing is, um, you know, nobody could, uh, could speak this classical modern Arabic or whatever that um, everybody is claiming, what you call it, is ancient. Yeah. They've um, basically invented it, you know, to show that this language came from the Middle East, but there is no evidence of this whatsoever. Yeah, we can't find this history. Yes. And um, let's see, where was I at before that Arabic writing errors? Yeah, let me just see so that I don't make a mistake. Yes. So now um, to go to the next page, we're here. Um, so now. Um, ah, I've already sent you this. Ah, uh, um, the, so basically there's no grammar and there's, um, there's no rules in colloquial Arabic. So these things were basically invented from somewhere. Yeah, um, no such thing as grammar for the vernacular or the colloquial. You know, um, in case, because they're using um, um, difficult words. Yes, um, let me just um, show you what does um, colloquial uh, basically mean. Yes, um, it's same like what do you call it? The Chinese speaking in the normal language. 
Yes, in the normal language that people are speaking, there is no such thing as these, um, you know, grammar or whatever in the ordinary language. Same like, um, you know, if I'm talking to my friends, I will not talk like, same like we're talking right now. I'll say, eh, you're coming out, time you out, time you out. What does that mean? It means what time are you coming out? You see, so many of these words that we're using now and other things, we don't actually use them in everyday language. Yes, you see, right. mm -hmm. I'm, I'm being clear now because, um, you know, I have to talk to you clearly because you're in another country and, uh, and other people will listen and uh, for, uh, so that um, people can um, understand. Well, anyway, it, um, so in these manuscripts, yes, what the Europeans did, Yes, and now they've t turned it into a language. If anybody wants to use this modern Arabic, you've got to put the proper mark so that you've got the proper vowel, A, E, I, R, O, R, U. Yes, and um, 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 the proper letter N and at the end to show in the Quran manuscripts how long is the thing pronounced or is it actually the letter N? Is it actually a plural? So um, let's, let's move on. Yes. Um, what do you call? Uh, what do you call it? Just, just to confirm, this is from the Saudis. Yes, um, from the Saudis to show that these diacritical marks are used to represent um, what do you call it? The three short vowels, a, i, u, as well as like an o sometimes or it depends. Yes. So um, the thing is, but the alif is also used to represent an a. So what these people did is that they put these marks there to pronounce an a, but we, there's already an a. And in English, we don't need the, the marks. And in the old Arabic that we see that's written all over Europe doesn't even have these marks. Yes. So it, and many of the older Arabic manuscripts don't even have these marks. So now, so the thing, the idea for the, for the pronunciation, notice here, I put it in a blue. Yes. Um, at the end of a noun or something, yes, you pronounce it, but you don't write it or something. The end thing is to help the pronunciation and for other reasons. Yes. So the thing is, because they invented this literary languages, yes, because they invented it, yeah, that you could see the nun or the nonation or the n or whatever. They've even given it a terminology. Yes. Um, you know, they say it's Semitic languages uh, in the literary uh, Arabic doesn't have these blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So the thing is that they knew it's going to be difficult. So they play ar around with it. Yes. So what they did was that uh, um, now the thing is, I'm going to say this fast. People will have to pause. If you really want to study this, then um, um, open up your computer or television um, just to watch this video and go through it. Yeah, that you could go through the verbs or the subjects of a, of a word or nominative noun and the diacritic marks are there to show what is a noun or what is a nominative noun or to actually show the subject or the verb. Now, the moment you remove these marks, yes, then it becomes totally different. It just becomes colloquial or everyday language. So then the Quran becomes everyday language and you can't define the nouns, the tenses or the root words because the thing is, for example, um, when you're saying something like, um, um, let me see now, um, I'll, I'll use a language that uh, maybe you won't, you won't know. I want you to tell me, choose one word from the sentence that I'm saying. Akujinta pata kamu. Pata. Akujinta pata kamu. I'll say. Where are the words? You don't know yeah, this I, language. I read it. Yeah, I, then of course I have no clue where the. Yeah, so you cannot are. define the words in that. Akujinta pata kamu. Akujinta pata mu. Akujinta saya kamu. You don't know which one is a word until I tell you the meanings and I present the dictionary in front of you. You see, so then you will be able to define the root words. Now, because the Quran is an oral book. It's an oral book, actually. Yes. So the thing is, because people are reciting it in a tone, some people will say it's singing or chanting. I don't want to get into a debate about this. I'm trying to make it simple. Yes. So the thing is, when you hear the sounds, you don't know where the root words are. You don't know where the, the words end, uh, unless if you know the language. Now, when you realize what this language is, it's actually colloquial or what you would call simple everyday language. So it's a simple storybook, uh, um, a history book, a religious book, or whatever you want to call it. Yes. So now um, the thing is, um, uh, many people know that even in the, even in the history, um, recent history, or even in the forged history, there was no, no di diacritics. Now, what do you call it? Yes. Um, 
when you add these, you know, accents, things like in the French, it, it changed the meanings, things like this, everything. And now that we've got different diacritics in different manuscripts, you got a serious problem. Yes. So who wrote the manuscripts? Let's move to African history now. Central Africa. Yes. And what are we going to see here now? Yes. Missionary and private schools were nationalized one year after Sudan gained, gained independence. They, um, they were taken over, yes, by the Sudanese government in 1956. Before then, every single school was run by the British, the French, the Italians, um, Spanish, Portuguese and their allies, whoever was involved. Only then, wait a minute, there wasn't even a single school by the Sudanese. Not even a single one. What's going on? That's why the world was, they tell you the world was illiterate 100 years ago. Or did right. the world have a different method of knowledge? Was the world um, um, had education in a different way? So now let's go to um, the rest of this Sudan thing. So now they've got no schools. If they've got no schools, they've got no books. They've got no manuscripts. In Sudan, as, as in other Muslim colonies or all of the colonies like the French, British, Spanish, Italians, whatever. Yes, there were relatively um, few military co confrontation, but whatever that means, I'm not sure. But anyway, they, um, what do you call it? They left the schools. Yes, uh, they opened all these schools. And um, here is an example. Um, I think it's three generations of one family. Um, and the thing is, um, he's just written a simple story. But he doesn't know that I'm going to go through these things um, for the history. So here is, um, what do you call it? Somebody wrote a story about his life and then um, uh, he's got his father or his grandfather in the middle. Now, these people were just simple people like um, Bedouins and things like this in Sudan. Now, many of them don't look like black Africans, so we can tell that they came from the north. And um, the thing is, who the hell would want to live in Sudan like a desert land? A hundred years ago, there was like um, hardly any, 100, 200 years ago, we can't find any fixed buildings. Like, how are you going to find the water? How are you going to do farming? How long are you going to survive? How are you going to give birth to children? How are you going to do anything here? So now, what do you call it? Yes, um, everybody remembers. So this history, they need, need to wait another hundred years until they change it. So same like in Vietnam and in Colombia or in Venezuela or in Peru or in Santa Domingo or anywhere else in Latin, Latin Americano. Yes, you will find British, Spanish, whatever. Yes, these people came. All the facilities. Yes, and um, for example, um, the schools the post office, the hospitals, or the clinics for the colonial people, they were, and, and uh, anybody who they were training, yes, um, what do you call it, yes, um, uh, um, the British built them and maintained them with their colonial allies, yes. Now, this guy, he went to one of these um, colonial schools, yes, and um, the thing is, um, what do you call it, yes, and he turned around and says, hey, um, the other people didn't go, and then he turned around and says, I was lucky. Yes, because now I've managed to progress. Was he lucky or, or did the European colonial um, is rob their country, stop the development of their nation and, um, you know, cause these problems? But anyway, yes, um, it was um, the British gave him a job as a health worker for that time, whatever health means. Yes. Um, he was looking after camels carrying local goods, you know, like these Bedouins or whatever. So if they had camels, they must have come from the north. Yes, because they've got lighter skin and they got dark, uh, darker because of the sunlight and the intermarried. And he says he went to a boarding school, boarding school, because you're sleeping overnight, built by the British, the Eaton of the Nile, you see? And um, what do you call it? Yes, etc. So um, the thing is, the Europeans opened these schools there. Yes, you can see this to educate the elite so that then these people will become the young generation and they're going to become the ruling families of these places. Yeah, what we find in Sudan from the European Scientific Journal, um, many people have checked this, you can check from photographs and asking the old people, um, many of them are still alive and they can remember what their grandparents did, what their parents did. There were young children in the 1950s, 1940s. There is no evidence that there was any library in the entire country or anywhere in the region. And remember, these people were nomads. Yes. Um, yes. And um, the thing is, they're just moving around, you know, um, to survive yes so um, let me just show um, how important sudan is because it's it's um, a big part of um africa and um, um when we go through sudan um we can see that um central africa sudan 
and the Congo. Yes. So in case many people don't know, neighboring countries like Kenya, Ethiopia, um, they call it Belgian, Congo, French, French Guinea, and all these other places. Yeah, I'm just um, getting a map ready um, from colonial times. Then you'll see French West Africa, British East Africa, and then um, British South Africa, and things like this. So um, the thing is, the, um, the Euro Europeans are there, they deleted the history. Of course, there's going to be no libraries or anything there. Same like what they did in Egypt. They confiscated the books, burnt everything, and um, you know, disposed of all the evidence of a previous civilization. So Sudan is in Central Africa on the border with um, Belgian Congo. Yes, and the Belgians were in Congo. They did the same thing. So now let's go through Sudan, that um, because this history is Sudan hasn't changed um, uh, um, as much as, let's say, Colombia has or Indonesia or Malaysia has progressed since colonial times. Let's see what we can find. At the time, um, what do you call it in Sudan, they had their own Islamic schools. But anyway, let's have a, have a look at what we did see this here. Um, the British invented the history, but um, what can we find? Um, ah, go to the second paragraph, the importance of holy men. Holy just meant, you know, somebody that you turn out say just a priest in the church, just some local guy, you know, just a local guy and he's religious and you say, ah, he's a nice guy. He doesn't lie. In every, in, uh, on every street, we've got these in our society. Yes, um, they were called holy because their abilities to teach and memorize the Holy Quran. So that's what the people did. Yes, and um, they used of their storage ca um, capabilities of books, but they did, didn't have real books because every holy man was a living library, as described by, you know, these European libraries. They, these men were living encyclopedias and mobile libraries. You see? Yeah, the, um, there is no evidence so far to support the existence of any type of organized library or anything in Sudan during the colonial period whatsoever. Most of the most of these religious men, you know, uh, um, uh, we've got many people who can memorize the Quran in every city in Europe. Yes, Muslims. So anyway, they had small collections of books. It's not books what we define as books today. Yes, or manuscripts. It's like on leaves or something. Yes. Um, you know, a few basic things, you know, how to make halal meat and um, things like this and how to pray. So even before the British and the French put the Mus um, put these Muslim history hadith books there, which claim to show how the Muslims prayed, these people already had the basic Islamic prayer system. So the Islamic prayer system, how to make the Islamic halal meat and everything else, and um, how to do the marriage things and other things, and uh, how to do the funeral things and everything else, was already established before the British printed and the French and the Vatican and their libraries printed these fake books and wrote them and they put them throughout, um, you know, Africa, Asia, Europe and the Americas. They put these books there. Yes. So anyway, and then let's have a look at a, a, another thing. Some books were there. Go to the bottom paragraph. And what does it say? Most of these books, a few of them that were there in the 20th century. Egyptian origin. From Egypt. And who put these Egyptian books there? The Europeans. Mm hmm. So now the thing is, when we go, let's go back to Sudan a little further. Yes. So Sudan will explain the Muslims in Congo, the Muslims in um, Kenya, Uganda, the entire region. Yes. Not just the Muslims, but the entire region's history. Yes. And um, throughout these colonial places. So now what do we find here? Formal education did not arrive until uh, um, when we say formal, they opened a few schools you know, probably about a few percent, less than 10% um, when they opened in the 1880s. Yes, there was no formal education. Everybody went to a Halwa school. A Halwa school, what do you call it? Yes, where they studied another type of mathematics, which um, we uh, um, know, uh, known as algebra, or um, algebra comes from, is linked to the word Gibrael or Gabriel or angel maths. Yes. And that was the original system of the of the um, cube or Kaaba of Allah and this mathematics that's called Kaaba Allah. Yes, to Western Orientalists, they defined it as Kaaba Allah. Yes, it's because there was some some um, Muslim comments from somebody saying Qibla doesn't mean Kaaba Allah. Hey, these words existed 
before the Quran even arrived. The Quran was written in an existing language. Anyway, they learned advanced Arabic language um, studies, and this is not the advanced Arabic language that, um, what you call it, the so-called fake classical language that the Europeans installed with the European teachers. But anyway, the, these Halwa schools, they're not schools. It's like, can you imagine, um, what do you call it? Um, let me just show you like a tent house in the desert, like made of straw or something. Um, um, when you see these houses, it's like um, some people sitting inside them and um, what do you call it? Yes. And um, it's not exactly a school. Yes. Um, the thing is, when you when you see them, um, the thing is, um, they were just sat inside. And um, the thing is, um, what do you call it? Yes. You know, about five people, maybe 10 or something. And, and um, they memorized the Quran. They memorized it because something was wrong. Yes, and they knew it because they came from the north, they came to the south. South Sudan will insist and say, many of the darker skinned people will say, hey, they came from the north, they intermarried, they look halfway between, um, what do you call it, the Greeks, they look um, halfway between the Greeks and the Central Africans because they intermarried. Yeah, so you can't exactly call these schools. Yes, so they were just sitting inside there learning and the real development of formal education, you know, um, like um, was um, the Europeans came and they imposed it and then they established libraries. Yes, until the first library was established basically after um, the Gordon Memorial College or General Gordon. It's not like he's a garden, you know, General Gordon was, um, you know, um, um, what do you call it? Yes, the Sudanese will describe him as a killer, as a murderer. Yes, and um, the thing is these people, you know, they were um, generals. Yes, and the thing is just to fit in Yes, with um, many things, um, what do you call it? Yes, um, thing is um, these um, generals, um, let me just show you. You know, they were going around, they had guns and these people, poor people in the desert. Yeah, what the hell could they do? Yes, and the thing is, um, I think he was in China as well, I'm not sure. Well, I'm not sure which one he is. There's um, Major Charles General and he's in China, dressed in Chinese clothes, and he's also in Sudan. Maybe he served two different posts, you know. An army general going there saying, go and sort these, these people out here, you know, uh, um, sort them out means, you know, just shoot them, get rid of them, they're, they're getting in the way. Yes. So um, the thing is, um, what do you call it? Yes. And um, let me explain to you, um, let's see, um, now let's go to the next page of um, these reports and, uh, and these reports are there. And it's not just the reports, the people are still alive that you can ask them. So what do you call it? Yes, the education in the colonial pe period described by Sir James Curie. Of course, they're going to be called Sir. They didn't go there without a visa. <laughs> yeah, but um, if the Sudanese want to come to Europe now, oh, they need a visa. Yes, why did they open these schools? To enable the masses to en understand the system of um, the European government, you know, that they put this government there to train a small class of competent artisans um, so that they can provide, um, you know, administrative classes for entry to the government service. In other words, these are going to be the future elites. They were training them. And then when these people got trained, hey, those same people are now the leaders. And then the village people accepted them. They're the rulers. That's what was called independence throughout all these colonial mm -hmm. places everywhere. You can see it, yes. So uh, um, uh, um, that's what goes on. And then what do you call it? Yes, the policy. Over-education poses a greater threat to the country than no education at all. <laughs> yeah, don't teach them no real education. In other words, teach them rubbish. You understand? Yes, so that they can be the new administrators. Yes, for the colony. Teach them mathematics and accounting so that it's going to be on the interest-based system. Teach them languages and um, the new classical Arabic or anything else so that they can do anything. But um, it's a well-known fact that um, according to them, in, for these modern languages and these modern, modern alphabets and everything, illiteracy throughout the world. Yes, it was very high. Illiteracy, Arabs, Europe, America, Japan, you name it. It's because people didn't know all, all, all these things. Yeah, it was a similar case, you know, during the medieval times that these so-called people who were copying manuscripts for the Vatican because they all worked for the churches, they didn't, they weren't even literate. That's why when they copied the manuscripts, <laughs> handwriting's pathetic in many of them. Yeah, it's just that you got to realize and understand they couldn't actually read and write many of them. They were just mm -hmm. copying it because it was inventing history. <laughs> you see?
Yeah. Oh, it must have been so much fun. You know, I'm sure that these people are laughing. Yeah. So much fun that people believe all this history. Well, anyway, let's go further. Um, this is another document or is it? Yeah. So now um, the educated S Sudanese, the ones that they educated now, look what happens to them. Yes, by the 1930s and 40s, they've grown up now. These kids that they were training have now grown up. What happens? They realize that they've got to open libraries. So now these Sudanese are establishing the libraries. Same like these Tunisians are establishing um, the libraries. Same like these Egyptians who were trained by the British are establishing the libraries. Same like the Moroccans who were trained by the French are opening these libraries. Wait a minute, there's no libraries there in the first place. And they've been taught these new languages by the Europeans. And the Europeans are going to say, oh, we already knew this. This is genuine Arabic we taught them. This is genuine Sudanese language we taught them. Genuine in Tunisian Arabic we taught them. Excuse me. Can you see what's going on here? Mm -hmm. These people already knew the language. Same like they went to Vietnam. They knew Vietnamese even before the Vietnamese did. They knew Chinese before the Chinese knew, knew the Chinese. Now, many people yeah, are just sat there and they'll put comments on that sound ridiculous. Yes, um, um, because the thing is, my videos are made as an extension to my books. Now, for example, you're not going to understand this here at all. And you can say, what's he talking about? So the thing is, um, you know, my books are there. If you've not read them, please don't comment and say, I don't understand, or I think this is this. It's not enough if you don't have evidence. Tadar City Souls, what the Europeans did in, um, what do you call it, in China, how they invented the languages, invented the history. China is a big place. We're talking as big as North America. The United States are as big as Europe. So they invented the total thing. If they could do that for that place, what do you think they did around the rest of the world? Yeah, of course. So the thing is, um, you know, please. Yes, um, the thing is, um, you know, when you comment, please realize there are people there who genuinely want to learn history. And if you are from a religious background, Christian, or Jewish, or Islamic, or Buddhist, please don't put your religious ideas there. History is history. We're trying to get to the bottom of history here. It is not about religion here. Yeah, so anyway, so so now, let's see now. Um, let's have a look. Um, let's go back to that um, previous page. I'll send it to you again, and then you're going to think, what the hell? So this is what they did in every country around the world. They did this in India. They did this in Pakistan. They did this, you name it. Yes, yeah, um, uh, and you, you'll you see um, what you call it, yes. So now these people, they've grown up, these Sudanese, and then the prime minister of Egypt, Ali Pasha, when he visited the Sudan, yes, the Egyptian government. There is no Egyptian government, it's British people, yes, should undertake to establish an Arabic public library in Khartoum with a good collection of Arabic books in order to strengthen the culture, cultural ties. There's no libraries, no nothing in this country, yes. And um, what do you call it? These young Sudanese, of course, you know, both places are occupied by the British, French and their allies. They're saying, yeah, they're, well, they are the students. You know, it's like, um, if, I, um, if I'm paying you and I brought you up since childhood, you're going to be doing what I'm saying. Yes, the Sudanese question was brought up in 1946, etc. Go to the ne next paragraph, and it says, prominent Sudanese gentlemen had applied to establish a public library in Omdurman. At, at his expense, but the government had refused to grant him permission. So now they're trying to show, hey, there's this, that politics. No, they're all on the same side. So the first public library in Sudan was established in Wadmadani in 1947 by some educated Su Sudanese. Who educated them? Pure reference for right. the collection used for private studies. <laughs> yeah, you're beginning to see? Yes. So now let's um, um, go further. You'll find the same history in Congo. You'll find the same history in Uruguay, in Paraguay, you name it. Yes, you'll find it everywhere. Yeah, um, wherever you go, Thailand, Burma, you'll find the same thing. Yes. Um, so what do you call it? Yes. Um, so now that the first public library has been established by these educated Sudanese, purely reference collection for private studies. Yes, these are the manuscripts or whatever, and the borrowing service. We're talking to only about a few hundred people who went to the same school. It's the same people. Hardly anybody else went to the school. Then they opened the second library. Yes, about the same time in Omdurman by the British Council. Yes, and it turned out says, um, Wilfred Plum, 
what did he say? One of the British agents, you know, Jesuit agents or whoever, masonry agents or whatever. An excellent small public library housed in a in small room. Yeah, with pictures, carpets, comfortable chairs, 4,000 books, 300 pamphlets, 35 current pe periodicals. Wait a minute. There's nothing there in this country. Now they're mysteriously going to find hundreds of books, thousands of books, ancient books, ancient manuscripts. Everything is there today. It started then, and then, you know, every year more and more things were added. Are you beginning to see what's going on? And now today, many of these books are just in museums, and soon they're going to say, ah, it's a thousand years old. So now let's go back to this. Yes, under the under the European administration. Yes, um, the thing is um, Henderson in 1945. Yes, um, what do you call it? No, Douglas Newball was the administrative secretary, and um, what do you call it? Henderson gave a description. Uh, at the time of how they invented Sudan, you know, gave its borders. So they established a cultural center to invent the culture of, of Sudan so that when people grow older, they'll think this was our culture. Whereas many people can remember it today, but in 200 years time, nobody will remember the culture. Same like in um, Europe, let me just show you an example of how people imagine European culture. Now, the thing is, this is in, in, in my book, um, Nazi Germany, or in my book um, called Adolf Hitler, yeah, what you will see is that um, people imagine European culture. Now, in Eastern Europe, many people don't imagine it because it's still poor, so they can remember it. But in Western Europe and in North America, people cannot remember the past. And so the thing is, it's because, you know, um, they've, they've worked so hard here that the history has gone. So now the thing is what the average person will imagine, yes, because of the history that we've been told, yeah, which is nothing to do with reality. It's just a bogus invention. Only a minority of people dress like this, but everybody seems to imagine that the 19th century looked like this in Europe and America. But there is no evidence for this, wait, I'm just uh, sending it to you. Um, Let's see. Yeah. Um, yeah. People seem to imagine this is the actual culture of Europe. Um, wait. Can you still hear me? Yes. Ah, yeah. Yeah. So people imagine this is the actual culture of Europe. Have you got the picture with the hats? Yes. yes? Now it's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is what they're actually showing, but the reality is something different. When we actually have a look, for some reason, they're actually hiding that um, Europe a hundred years ago, yes, mysteriously, yes, a um, hundred years ago, Western Europe I'm talking about, and um, North America, yes, the majority of, of the women in the 19th century actually dressed like this, yeah, which nobody seems to know about, yes. And the thing is, it's because uh, um, they set up these cultural centers throughout the entire colonial world so that people won't know. And so the thing is, um, um, uh, when people see this, they're surprised. And the thing is, um, so the only way you'll understand is if you accept the reality. Yes, that the majority, this is in my book, um, Adolf Hitler, and in um, many of my other books. Yes. So if somebody's going to say, hey, I don't know this, it wasn't in France, it wasn't in Germany, it wasn't in Holland, it's in my books, guys. Yeah, if you've not read it, yeah, then I'm sorry. You know, there's nothing nothing more I can do. Yeah, I've done my best. I've made videos. I'm trying to make um, information simple and um, clear. Yes. So um, now let's um, continue with um, what happened in um, Sudan. Yes. And I'm sending you this page to show. So what they did is, you know, we're going to set up these social centers and things like this, museums, etc., cultural centers. Uh, so who set it up? British administrators and Sudanese British employees who were educated by the British, not um, Sudanese government employees. Yeah, just because they're from Sudan doesn't make a difference. Yes. So uh, uh, then it was it was accepted and they they did it with um, library, lecture rooms, amenities, you know, the beginning of education. Yes. For the entire uh, entire system. So that's how it's going to go. Yes. So um, the thing is, um, you know, they opened all these things and in this um, center when it was opened on 25th of April, they had uh, um, over a thousand English books, 280 so-called Sudanese Arabic books, because Sudan, um, yeah, um, they say, has got an um, Arabic language or something. So anyway, it was set up by them. Yes, the Jesuits and their allies. 
So now let's have a look at Khartoum, the capital of Sudan. Now, when people see this today, now this picture can be misleading because um, you can see that uh, on the right-hand side, it looks a bit modern, but on the left-hand side, you could still see that Khartoum, yes, is um, not so modern. Now, a hundred years ago, you'll notice that when the Europeans were there, yes, um, these buildings were there. And the thing is the construction of these buildings um, doesn't make sense. How the hell did they build them in the middle of nowhere? Unless mm -hmm. if, um, um, yes, uh, either they were already there or um, they were built recently. Yes, but anyway, um, the thing is um, the Europeans opened all these schools. Yes, um, what do you call it? Yes, and now let's look at Khartoum. So now when people look at Khartoum or Khartoum or Khartoum, I say um, the capital of Sudan, let's have a look at um, what happened. So after the Europeans um, are leaving its independence, yes, between 1960 and 1990, the population of Khartoum grew tenfold to over one million, or today it's five million. Yes, since 1990. By 1990, it was um, a million, uh, um, one million. In 1960, it was about 100,000. So today it's 5 million. We're talking, it's like Miami. Yes, yeah. So um, the thing is, um, let's go through Khartoum and then people will begin to understand this. Now, Khartoum city. Now, the thing is, this is the actual reality. Yes, um, the Sudanese people didn't basically live there. Khartoum's population in 1913 was only about 25,000. Yes, in 1900, it was about 10,000. In 1880 or 1850, it didn't exist. It didn't exist. So, but they've got the invented history of Khartoum, the entire uh, um, place, everything, all these manuscripts, all these books. We found them, they're ancient and everything. Let's have a look at this place in 1913. It was just a few thousand people, the British, and they and they brought some people from the desert. Um, yes, you know, paying them and whatever. And um, they're bringing them up in schools. This is Khartoum in 1913. Can you see it? What do you see there? It's just a few streets, mm -hmm. nothing else. It's just a few, few streets that um, let me just show more pictures, then people will get the message. Yes, the thing is, um, it's just a few streets. In 1900, about uh, um, 10,000 people. This is 1930. Can you see it? Those few streets, and they've made it a bit bigger, but there's too much open space. There's nothing there. Can you see? Yes, it's, it's just a small village that's grown bigger. Uh, let me show a side view of the same place and then you'll begin to see. And now people, because uh, um, why are people coming to the city? It shows you can't live in the desert forever and these people have not been there for a long time. So that means the people migrated south. They were running. What were they running from? First from Europe, they arrived to Egypt, then you run further south. Yes, that's why, and even the Africans will say they came from the north. So now let's have a have a look at the, some of the pictures, even in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, of what the people look like in Sudan, in Khartoum. And the thing is, many people started coming. Look at the first picture, and um, you'll see the living conditions. They've come outside the city, and they're farming shanty towns. And um, the thing is, because I've done construction work and um, projects in um the Middle East um, several times. So I know um, they still use the process today because the Middle East is 50 years behind um, Europe. Yes. Um, so the thing is, what you'll notice is that, um, that the, it looks like there's some type of stones or something there piled up. It's because those things are there. It's to prepare construction for the houses. Those people are wearing the white cotton cloths um, made in Europe, and you can see the living conditions. These people are a bit more wealthier compared to the people actually roaming the deserts. You see? Yes. So these mm -hmm. people, as you can see, they've got no idea, no education for the Western standard to understand what the hell is going on or what the Europeans have done. And they don't know what's in these manuscripts. They're finding out now, and in 50 years' time, they're going to be investigating these manuscripts. I'm um, saying, like, saying, hey, this history don't make sense. This photograph, the sky is missing. Hey, this building doesn't make sense. How the hell could us Sudanese have built this? We didn't have this technology. We didn't have this. That's when they'll start thinking, damn, somebody else made this. This is what's going on in Europe right now. Tataria groups, all these other things. This history doesn't make sense. They're not there yet. Wait 50 years and they will be there. Do you understand now? Mm -hmm. Yes. They'll say, hey, how can this be our history? All these ancient kingdoms, thousands of years, hundreds of years. Ancient Egypt was in South Sudan. This, that. It doesn't make sense. How could they build this monument to 2,000 years ago? 
it doesn't make sense. It's because they put these things there. That's what they did in Europe um, three, four hundred years ago. Yes. So now other public libraries, the next page, were founded during the colonial pe period in, in all the other provinces, etc. And um, what do you call it? Yes. They set up all these local councils, similar lines with the British local authorities. Yes. And um, what do you call it? Yes. And to set up schools. To, to set up the general technical education of this place, adults, education clubs, reading rooms, libraries, everywhere, throughout um, throughout the entire land. Yes? Yeah. First, the library, it mentions it again. Yeah, the Blue Nile province. Yeah, it goes through that again. Um, maybe this is from a different um, document. But the, but the story is basically there. Um, so what they did, they did it in, in the center in Khartoum, or what they called the center of the population place. And then it spread. Can you see it? Yes. They're opening more now, duplicating these. Yes. Um, what do you call it? Yes. Um, the thing is, um, the, uh, what these units were, were small units, self-contained, unable to draw upon, you know, book resources or professional skills. Yes. Um, now, this is the most important part. What's the middle paragraph? You read it yourself. The middle paragraph? Yes, the whole library yeah, development. The, the whole library development in colonial Sudan, as indeed in the rest of Africa, was best summed up by Holdsworth. Thus, I continue, in Africa, the yeah. pattern of library growth shows a progression from what one might call bread and butter libraries, <laughs> that is, from libraries <laughs> indispensable for the proper exercise of the functions of there a you state, go. Anyway, the colonial you've got the government. General message. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. throughout Africa, there wasn't a single library in the sense of what we call libraries today that will say, hey, they had these historical monuments, they had this. Oh, right now, they're fabricating the Timbuktu library. Timbuktu is 50 years behind Sudan's Khartoum. One day we'll have to go through it and you'll say, what the hell? How can they have these hundreds of manuscripts, pages and thousands of pages of manuscripts when there is no even civilization there? I'll go through that next time. They're preparing this now for Timbuktu in Mali in a hundred years time in um, West Africa. Aha. Well, anyway, the simple thing is just like the rest of Africa, these were bread and butter libraries, you know, they're, they're just, um, you know, what Donald Trump will call them shit holes. Yes, there was nothing there. No libraries, no whatsoever, no manuscripts. If there was any manuscripts or anything, they destroyed them, they got rid of it, and they're setting up the schools, everything, to teach these new invented languages and everything else. It was throughout Africa, throughout Latin America, throughout North America, throughout Europe. They set up all these libraries. It started off um, during the Renaissance, you know, 15th, 16th century, with this, with um, the invasion from Egypt, um, Firan or Pharaoh and the boys. Yes, the military general known as the Papa or the Pope. Yes, um, so it started off from there. They thought uh, it, it's been 500 years. They're still co continuing it. Yes, um, you know, Timbuktu will have to go through that another day. But as you can see, there's nothing there. What does that tell you about the history of Africa? They've deleted it. They went around killing people, raping people, destroying all the evidence. They did this in Europe. Anything, it took them centuries, they blew up anything, they um, remodeled many buildings throughout Italy, in Spain, that had Arabic writing, in Switzerland, in France, they just scrubbed them off, replaced them, replastered, redecorated, changed buildings into churches, are you beginning to see what they did, mm -hmm. and into mosques, these so-called modern mosques, you know, redesigning buildings, hiding their original functions, removing the industry, putting the world backwards, anybody who resisted, blow them up that's what they did in these wars are you beginning to see what happened mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes so now um let's move on and what do we now um this is important because now let's go back to this duri quran now, the government schools were competing not government they're not government it's the it's the british the french the vatican the spanish the portuguese and the dutch they're throughout all the world so now in the Islamic territories, there were competition for the Kalwas or the Quranic schools where people are memorizing the Quran, learning how to pray and everything else. Yes. Therefore, they tried to prove by non-intervention that they started to give money and bribes to these Islamic schools. And then they were what they did is that the Europeans set up these Islamic schools instead. You understand? 
Yes. Right. So mm -hmm. what they did was that uh, and then everybody thought, hey, these people are nice people. So they did the same thing. And um, what do you call it? Yes, in Egypt and everywhere else and in India, in Pakistan, you name it, the Russians were doing it. Um, they were doing it everywhere so that then they can uh, um, bring these manuscripts and their own agendas. Yes. So that's what they did. Yeah. So um, um, now the next point. So as we can see, the Islamic system is there before the fake Muslim history known as Hadith in Arabic um, is there. So if we remove the Hadith, yes, the Islamic history is still there. Um, the Quran and the Islamic system still exists even before they put these books there. Yes. So now um, um, the thing is um, the manuscripts of the Holy Quran. So now, for example, they're going to say that um, implementation to repair and restore ancient manuscripts in Sudan has started. Now they've mysteriously found many ancient manuscripts in Sudan. <laughs> now this is 50 years later. Yeah, let's go through some of this. Oh, it's the same in Mali, Mauritania, in Vietnam, you name it, in Thailand, in um, Cambodia. So now they've mysteriously found these handwritten Qurans, ancient ancient antique Qurans and everything, they've mysteriously found them. Yeah, these Bedouins who are running around in camels who can't find food and everything, they've run from the north and um, something's going on in Europe. And now these people have got these ancient Quran manuscripts. And then um, mysteriously, oh, they're going to say they're on leaf manuscripts and other things. And, um, uh, uh, um, you know, not just in Sudan, but throughout the region. Like, for example, Quran, probably 19th century manuscript. Yes, leaf manuscripts for sale at Christie's. Yes. So they're going to say this is an original we stole from them in colonial times. Yes. So what do you call it? Yes. Um, so but then um, there's many other things like uh, many people have realized that some of them are not actually ancients. Like, for example, this here. Yes. That you can go through it. Arabic manuscripts on European watermarked paper. Yes. Uh, are, um, so then there's. Um, you know, with the leaves manuscript, somebody's got um, from Nigeria, all these Qurans and other places the, the Europeans are going to say we stole it from there. There is no evidence of this whatsoever. So now mysteriously, these people, when you see their living standards and everything, we can know that these people did not invent these manuscripts. Look at these manuscripts They're They don't look ancient. They, they don't look a thousand years old. Not only that, they have the diacritical marks that you will find that is from recent invention of the modern French language because people in France couldn't even speak French. Yes, a hundred years ago, the majority. Yes, so you'll see these diacritical markings. Can you see them? Yes, yeah. on these manuscripts. So this is how we know, oh, they're telling us this is a thousand years ago. How can it be a thousand years ago when it's got the diacritical markings? Yes, let me, I've enlarged it to show you that um, it can't be a thousand years ago. Yes, and the Sudanese didn't even need these things. Yes, yeah, and they already had their Islamic schools. They had the Quran memorized and they already knew the Muslim prayer system and uh, um, um, everything else. Yes, um, it was just basic and simple. So now Sudan today, just to verify it in case somebody thinks I'm making it up. Yes, it's um, Khartoum has got 5 million people and there was nothing there uh, from, uh, from calculating in 1850. We can't find it, but they're going to show you that there's so much history. These manuscripts are a thousand years old and everything, but the population in 1913 was only 25,000. Take away the colonial administrators and um, all their students and their families that they brought with them, that um, even in 1913, it will be a, a few thousand. And these people came because the colonial buildings are there. When you move them away, there is no reason for the Sudanese to um, have even settled there. They would have probably gone back up north. And they're yes? just uh, theorizing or maybe have some evidence for this. What would be the reason if this initial population maybe is refugees from Europe, for example, why would the new colonial administration rather re-educate than just completely exterminate them to just create slave states ah, or what would I will be the tell reason? You something. How are you going to exterminate them? Because don't forget, we're from Europe. How are you going to live there? 40 degrees, 50 degrees, running around. How are you going to get the guns in there? There's no roads. Oh, it's only recently that the Chinese just built the East African Railway, the other railways, things like this. It's difficult. How are you going to access these people? How you can find them? They're just going to get on the camels and run away. <laughs> They'll just put their tent somewhere else. You All right. See? Uh -huh. 
Yeah. So um, um, uh, there were these problems. So, so there is a war going on between these two sites. Um, um, what do you call it? Um, I'll go through it in a minute. You know, Pharaoh and his followers and the humanists, and the other side, Moses and his followers, are these so-called Muslims. Yeah. So now the thing is, many people, it, last time we went through it, um, that there's no concept of he or we when you remove these diacritical signs. And um, the Europeans played around between the um, manuscripts um, um, between um, um, the Egyptian and um, the other one, um, the North African manuscripts, and you'll notice that it says a he in one translation, in, in another it says a we. It doesn't say either. When you remove these so-called diacritics for, for the personalities, you don't have any of it. Yeah, there was a comment there of the so-called Islamist or Muslim ex experts who were coming on saying, yes, it does, yes, it does, prove it. Prove it, or why do these manuscripts show this? In one manuscript, it says he, or it says we. It's because this were, these were invented from the European terminologies of the pluralness um, of the European languages, that it had nothing to, of the plurality of the concept of God, that God is a he, yes, um, you know, God became man, Jesus Christ, and God became a we due to the Trinity. This concept is not in the Quran, if anybody reads it. So it contradicts what the Quran says. Oh, by the way, in case somebody is, um, what do you call it? Yes, have they, if they, in case they've forgotten, yes, um, the French education, everything in the French politicians. Um, uh, um, no, I mean the Tunisians, Moroccans, Algerians, they all went to France. Yeah, uh, or in French schools, they were trained and um, they were um, same like, um, you know, the Sudanese in um, Western schools. So now the thing is, Farsi. Um, or the old Farsi a hundred years ago was basically 80% Arabic. So it wasn't even Farsi. It wasn't even Persian. It's just a dialect of Arabic. Yes. So that means it's a dialect of Arabic. Another thing is, um, what do you call it? Yes. The old Osmanli Turkish. Yes. That was used um, all the way up to Vienna. It was used in Ukraine, in other places in Germany, Osmanli Turkish, um, uh, based on the official history, even from there, that we don't need to go very far back. Only 100 years ago, these um, Tadars using Osmanli Arabic, um, you know, in northern Russia on the borders of Finland and everywhere else, and in Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, and they're using this um, uh, Osmanli Arabic, which is 90% Arabic, and um, but people will call it Turkish. It's basically Arabic. Now, the, the thing is, um, somebody has put a comment there. Yes, saying in the former Dutch colony of, um, what do you call it? Yes, um, Dutch, English, Germanic languages. Yeah, um, he, he points out, yeah, um, you know, that, um, what do you call it? Yes, um, former Dutch, yes, um, Quran in Bahasa, Bahasa, Indonesia. It means, um, what do you call it? Newspaper, all the Dutch. Yes, the English word Quranical. Yes the Quran, equal, yes, so newspaper, so it was actually supposed to be a message of God, yes, and now the thing is many people have been disputing, um, saying, hey, where did David get it from, um, the story that um, Pharaoh was drowned, yes, in the, in the Quran, or we will save you in the body, yeah, Quran, yes, save you in, in the body, and the thing is, um, let me just show you about um, the Pharaoh, um, now, um, what, what, the, what the Muslims um, don't do is that um, they don't go through um, the thing is word for word, excluding these, if you remove these so-called diacritics and everything. Now, the, the Quran, um, I'm just going to show you. Yes, what they show you, even for the word for word, is a fraud because of the classical Arabic dictionaries. So um, here I'm sending you, it talks about Pharaoh. Did he drown or was he saved or what happened? So now the thing is, um, in the Quran, what you will see, um, it says today, it doesn't say we, they've decided to put the we there. It just says God will save him. And then they say in his body. It's one, it says he will be saved. And then they say in his body. The Muslims try to claim this, but the Arabic word there, just in the classical Arabic, that um, if you go, you can even just do Google Translate or any dictionary. And then what you will find, it doesn't say, we will save you um, inside your body, which doesn't make sense. That the same word, when you translate it, it says, we will save you with your body. Now, the thing is, it turns around and says that what you call it, Pharaoh actually drowned in the Quran. Yes, let me explain. 
Um, let me show this. So the exact wording of the Quran, it says that, um, what do you call it? Pharaoh drowned. So now when he drowned, um, what, um, this is the Quran in the, in the sentence just before the one that I've sent you. I'm sending you the sentence that's preceding. And it turned around and says that um, Pharaoh drowned. Yes. So Pharaoh drowned. Then what he did was, what do you call it? Yes, Pharaoh testified that there is no God except um, one God. Yes, um, um, or, you know, no God except Allah, yeah? And it says Allah D means the one God, or, yes? So he's saying this and many of these Quranists and modern Muslims are saying, no, 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 um, this is not in Islam, but we can see it. It's there in the Quran and the vast majority of Muslims follow this. Now these Quranists will say, it came from the Muslim history books. No, the Muslim history books have only been there for about 150 years or 100 years and people are only reading these books in the last um, 30, 40 years more as the middle class is becoming more educated. So now Pharaoh declares he's just drowned on his last breath last breaths he declares there is no god except um, you know this one god yes or the god of moses so then it turns out says that um, um god replies and said okay we're going to save you with your body now the main thing is the quran does not specify after this at one at what point did pharaoh die after this or did he not die and um, did he live for another 10 years another 200 years or maybe he he lived for another minute that after, because it turned around and shows that according to the Quran, yes, it turned around and says that, um, what do you call it? Yes, it turned around and says that um, according to the Quran, it's, it shows that God is talking to the Pharaoh saying, we will save you. Yes, um, it's, um, yes, according, uh, ac well, it's not we, or it's God will save you. So it's it's talking to Pharaoh and saying, we will save you. So Pharaoh must have been alive at that point because he's just said to God or just testified, yes, that there is no God except Allah. Yeah, he's just testified this. And then, um, what do you call it? Yes. And um, the reply is, we will save you. Yes. Um, and then it says it's going to be a sign for mankind. Yeah. It says, it just says this will be assigned to mankind. So now many people, now this is a very important thing because the Jesuits come into this and their allies. Yes, um, it says this will be a sign for mankind, whatever it means, this sign. Yes. So um, the thing is, this has been, um, this sign is something that um, is, is a major topic for um, Christians, Jews and Muslims. Yes. So um, let's, go, let's go through it. I, yeah, so while I mentioned um, that these history books, yeah, so that people will know I'm replying to their comments, there's this comment here on the last video, yes, um, and, it, and it says in this comment, hey, David, you criticize um, Quranists are breaking down the prayer system, then you reject the Islamic history. It's not Hadith, it's Islamic history, Arabic Hadith. Uh, the prayer system was there before they put these books there. Yes, and now you're um, the person turned on said the same sources. Yes, is in the current modern Islamic prayer. No, the Islamic prayer system was already there. What they did was they wrote about this prayer system and they put it down with different things and added different things and deleted different things to confuse people. Because is um, in some of these things I read it because there's a similar thing in synagogues. Do you have one standing position or two standing positions or three or four? How many times do you pray? How many times do you fall on the floor? What do you read? So now, according to the Islamic history books that the Europeans put there, they put so many different versions, different places. In Iraq, one thing. In Iran, another thing. In Pakistan and in India, another thing. In Turkey, another thing. In Syria, another thing. In Egypt, another thing. In Tunisia, another thing. So all these caused confusion. But the fact is, the prayer system was already there because it's in Northern Europe. We can see it. Um, they were practicing this in Russia. Yes, that they were practicing this in Russia, what people call Tataria or the Russians. Yes, so they were practicing this prayer system. Yes, um, before. Now the thing is, so therefore we have to look at history. So this means all these Quranists who are trying to break down this system, it's just a fraud. Yes, um, it's just a fraud um, what these Quranists are doing um, because they're just trying to investigate their own things. So now the next thing is, um, now the thing is um, Pharaoh, um, the body of the Pharaoh who was supposed to have drowned, some people say it's um, Ramses. So other people say it's the Pharaoh Meram Peter or Meram Ta, yeah, or Meram Peter. There is a reason why I've said Meram Peter. And then um, somebody else is, um, what do you call it, yes? 
and people are saying it's my interpretation that Pharaoh survived. No, 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 this is in the Muslim, Muslim books. I'm going to show them in a minute. Yes, in the Muslim books it, and in uh, many Christian books and many Jewish books, not all of them, but many of them actually say that Pharaoh survived. I'm going to show the proof that hundreds of mosques, thousands of them, or the majority of the Sunni Muslims have been sharing these books for the last 30 years. And then when you look at them, you're going to think, oh my God. Yes. So, so the thing is, um, when Pharaoh, when Pharaoh was um, drowning, and um, this is what he says according to the Quran, because the Quranists now say there is no such thing as the declaration of the Islamic faith. So now the thing is, Pharaoh declares this, and he says there is no God but but um, one um, in the God of Israel, and um, he says this. And then the next sentence it says, if you translate it in classical Arabic, it turns around and says without the marks. Um, we will save you even without the mark. So that they must have changed even the spelling here compared to other manuscripts. We will save you with your body. But now the Muslims turn and say, no, no, no. Pharaoh was dead and he was saved inside his body. Some of them, not all of them, not all of them, by the way. So now um, this causes another major problem. So many Muslims um, um, uh, um, don't want to... Um, um, talk about it, but um, different Muslim scholars um, talk about it. We'll go through what Zakir Naik and the rest of them say in a minute. Yes. So now here, for example, in the Quran, it turns around says that um, Moses, that he sees the beard of Aaron. So therefore, many Muslims in the past, especially in Russia, that um, what do you call it? Yes, the Russians had many beards. Yes, and um, the Saint Moses of Russia. This is another long story um, that will of Novgorod and um, the fabricated history of Moses uh, called Saint Moses and um, from Novgorod. Or and um, I, or I, um, we'll go through that next time. So, so, so um, the thing is, many Muslims turn around and said Aaron had a beard, so we will follow his example because they wish, and um, they have not turned around and said that um, uh, they're trying, some people have, uh, they have not turned around and said everyone's got to do it, but some people are trying to force it on, on others. And it's known that many Orthodox um, um, Jews and rabbis, they follow the same system, they grow the beards because they say that it, Moses had the beard too, and so did Aaron. In some of their documents, they say that Moses had the beard. Yes, and um, it, clearly in the Quran, it says Aaron had a beard. Yeah, it doesn't mean that you have to grow one. I'm just pointing this out, by the way. So now the thing is, in Russia, when um, the Romanovs took over, the fake ones, or the Western Romans, yes, what happened is, yes, what they did was notice the name of, of, of the Tsar. He's called Tsar Peter the First. So at what point did the French really invade Russia? Was it Napoleon Bonaparte or was it before then? Yes, that, that, what do you call it? Yes, when they started, yes, to change the entire system, they changed the calendar and um, um, the Inquisition was going on there, that all the manuscripts had to be sent to a city called Petersburg and he's called Tsar Peter the First, yes, or Petra, yes, this Sam Garans and his Petra, on the rock of Peter, yes, Saint Peter or Pater or Father, yes, or the Pope on the rock of Saint Peter, they introduced this beer tax. So what they did was, in other words, get rid of your beer or you'll have to pay. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, they even beat people up, you know, not just a tax, you know, beat him up. It's not enough. Yes. So um, the thing is, um, I've even prepared, prepared this in case somebody wants to pause the video and go through it. Yeah, because I'm saying it very fast, because I noticed there's many of these Orthodox Muslims and Quranist Muslims who are just inventing their own things and saying uh, many things that I am saying things. I want them to check. The Muslim prayer system existed even before the historical Muslim hadith manuscripts were placed there. And the alternative interpretation, Pharaoh was saved. The Quran says this, not me. He was still, he was alive after he drowned to actually say this Shahada. At what point he died is not specified. I have not specified that either. But what I have specified is that the name Firan or Firan appears in the history provided by the New World Order connected to the Pope or the Baba or your dad. Yes. And oh, by the way, I'm going to show you now. Did you know that the Pope was actually God in Europe? Um, you know, the Firan, um, these popes in the 15th, 16th century. He wasn't just called Pope. He wasn't just your dad, um, Raphael. Did you know that he's actually God? 
Well, he is even today the vicar of Christ, which I guess within that oh, theology. I'm going to show you directly that um, um, if you didn't call him God, then you, you're going to be, they'll deal with you. And then the word Baba, Babylon, Baba also, mean, not only a gate, it means father, Pope. And then what do you call it? Baba El means the father is God, the Pope. And then Baba El Ion or An, the plural, yes, it means um, the father of the gods. Yes, and Pharaoh, according to the Quran, declared to be God. Yeah. So now, um, let me just show you. Let's go to, to some Islamic websites. What are these Muslim websites teaching? Yes. So I thought it'd bring it out because I learned it from there. So now the thing is, um, the thing is, the Muslims, yes, they have to educate themselves and wake themselves up. It's not me. It's uh, what does it say there? It says Ramses II has survived the, his body. So now some people will say it's just his body in mummified form. So they say Pharaoh survived. Pharaoh survived. His body survived. So they're going to say that's his body. So now let me just just go through this now. Now we are going to have a serious problem. Yes. Um, what do you call it? Yes. There's many reports. Now I'm going to show you some historical reports and um, scientific reports of Ramesses the second's body, and then afterwards. Um, the so-called um, Dr. Maurice Bukail from um, many Paris institutes. Um, this page, um, when you open it up, you'll see um, um, a scientific and um, historical report, and then you're going to understand. According to the archaeo archaeological evidence, what do we find about Ramesses II? He died at the age of 90 years old, and he was supposed to be, for the last 20, 30 years, in bed. Yeah, he was an old man. Wait a minute. He died uh, um, old, but the pharaoh who's supposed to have drowned was supposed to be young, you know, a warrior. He's on his chariot chasing after Moses. That at the most he would have been in his 60s. But this Ramses II who we've got here is in his 90s and he was on his bed from the mummy. Right. So that means I mean, here, it's, he, here it even says that uh, suffering from an extreme arteriosclerosis yeah. and then it says it could be oh, because those things you yeah, can't yeah, sure. prove it sure but yeah, that's in this explanation it says it could be because of his near drowning so they would say yeah, that's he was guessing. right yeah. right sure so now yeah. in the mummification process many people don't know so you use salt to preserve meat yes we all know this so that's why many people will say because he's got a lot of salt in his body that means he must have drowned that's no proof of anything. Okay, well, yes. did it really say that? Because that would be a very lame explanation or, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, no, 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 they, they have been saying it. Yes. Um, so now we got a problem. If that is Pharaoh, then that means he survived for another 20 years after um, his body came out. If that is Pharaoh. So now the Muslims are, many Muslims used to say that's Pharaoh. A lot of them, many say, can we really know what do you call it now? And um, what do you call it? Yes, these um, Egyptian scholars are saying, we don't even know if it's the, the body of the Pharaoh because the Muslims are now trying to say it's another Pharaoh called Meren Peter. Notice I've said Peter. Yeah, you'll notice that in a minute. Yes. Um, so now the thing is, um, what do you call it? Yes. And this is in, um, this is very important because I notice people are turning around and saying, hey, they found Pharaoh's mummy and everything. Yeah, that's what um, somebody from a Muslim background. Um, so the thing is, you know, um, the thing is, um, you know, I'm getting fed up of it. Yeah, yeah I'm not going to lie to you because I've, uh, my videos are made for people who've read my books or who are reading my books or are, who are genuinely studying history, not from a religious background. Yeah. So um, what do you call it? Yes, in my book, Ancient Egypt is not ancient. Yes, I pointed it out of the forgery of mummies in the 19th century and what they were used for um, during the Middle Ages um, when people used to eat human bodies and they used to preserve them. They used to wrap them up in cloths and um, um, what do you call it? Yes, put salt on them because people were eating people. <laughs> Hard to believe, but people were eating people. That's what you do. Same like when you're trying to preserve pickles, you put them in a jar. Um, when you're trying to turn it into a pickle, certain things you put salt, water, and, and things salt like is this. Standard technique for meat. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what they did is um, mummification was a big thing in Europe and everywhere. Actually, not for burial. They're lying, and the body parts were taken out because people mm. were eating them. Uh, yeah, people were eating them. So now there's going to be other people who are going to be commenting on the next video. Please don't.
Yes, if you haven't read read the book. So now I've explained this in my book, um, Skull and Bones, of um, the full history of eating people. Yes, it was a big thing. Yes. So now the thing is, if you, um, the thing is, and um, I've presented the evidence there. Um, um, so the thing is, um, it, it's a big topic. You can't just, um, you know, you can't just come out with it in a few, in a few minutes. Well, anyway, the thing is, um, what do you call it? Yes, they're going to say it was medicine. It wasn't medicine. It was actually food. Yes, what do you call it? Yes, that um, you've got somebody's dead body, um, the whole family. It seemed like you've got a dead young lamb. You know, young lamb, you're eating it, so you're eating a dead body. You're actually eating it. You're cooking it, mixing it with herbs, you know, probably mixing it with your bread and everything. What do you call it? Yes, and uh, um, historians are just going to say it's medicine. Yes. What do you call it? Yes. And so, uh, uh, and um, the thing is, many of the mummies came from Egypt. Egypt was the main exporting place. Egypt is the same place where this New Testament Bible came from. Yes. And the Old Testament. It's another long story. And this coin Greek. This is where the Pharaoh or Firan or the Papa or Pepe or Pope or Baba, all of them came from. Yes. Bab Elion. Yes. Or Babel. Yes, and then they invented the story that Babylon's in the Middle East because they extended history, another ancient Babylon, this and that, add on a few thousand years and things like this. So anyway, so now historians try to confuse you and say it was magic and superstition. No, people were just having breakfast. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, you know what I mean, something to eat. So, um, you know, historians will, will try to hide it that way. But many old people turn and say, hey, when my grandparents were around, um, you know, they used to do these things. So um, um, in the Victorian times. So the thing is, um, and it wasn't healing powders, yeah? It wasn't medicine, it was food. So because it was expensive, so somebody will say, hey, same like Red Bull, it's, it's seen as medicine. No, if you can afford Red Bull in Europe, you can. And if you can't afford it, let's say in, um, where do you call it, in North Korea, then, um, you know, yeah, um, it, you'll think, hey, it's for healing powers or something. No, it was actually food. Yes, and the rich and the elite were eating it. Yeah, they were eating people. They used to just find somebody who looks healthy. Yeah, are you big and healthy? Oh, he's good. He's been bodybuilding. That's good. Get him now. Burn him alive. Let's pretend he's a witch. Take his blood out and then wrap up his body, preserve it. Then take his body parts out. But we're going to, but when people know that these body parts have been taken out, oh, he, we'll say they were preserving these things. No, they were actually eating them. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's what was going on. And then um, the thing is, many people will say, hey, about these Egyptian mummies, yeah, many of them were fakes. Yes, um, in my book, a, um, the history of ancient Egypt doesn't exist. It shows that uh, many of these fakes, that uh, the Egyptian mummy scan scandal, that uh, many of them are empty shells filled with stones. They've been showing us these for decades in museums. Hey, this is genuine free um, from ancient Egypt, even the ones even in, 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 if you went to the museum in Rome, the Vatican controls it. Yes, you go there, you'll find out, hey, that what you call it, these mummies are fake, they're forgeries. Um, who knows what else is a forgery? Basically, they invented the, uh, the ancient history. Oh, by the way, yes, um, because the Vatican isn't powerful, yes, militarily at the time. So who do you think took the mummies there and whatever? So of course, because they got caught, they're going to turn out and say it was a British gang. Yeah, it wasn't a British gang, it was the British Empire. And they're saying team of 19th century fraudsters. They're all together. The museum knew it was fake. Mm -hmm. They all knew it's fake. Yeah, because it's fake history. They invented it. They just dumped them and say, hey, in Rome's museum. And they said, hey, these are genuinely ancient. Oh, yeah, history is a business. Yeah, you know what I mean? Just to hide the original history. Yeah, yeah. so now let's, uh, let's have a look at these Islamic websites again. Yeah, because the Muslims can't make their mind up. When did Pharaoh die? So the, the point is, the Quran says he was saved with his body. Um, it doesn't specify when he died. So um, the thing is, it turns around and says, um, what do you call it, many Muslim websites, the body of Ramses has survived in a mummified form. Yeah, they can't make their mind up. Yes, what happened? Yes, um, if it's Ramses or Merem Ptah. Yeah, so um, the, th uh, um, the thing is, um, they can't make their mind up. Yeah. Um, what do you call it? Yes. So now let's go to the next thing. Yes. And um, the thing is, um, yeah, even in the Muslim websites, they turn around and say, yeah, his body survived. 
yes um but what do you call it yes they can't um, give an explanation because these are the fake bodies and the europeans are the are these um french british agents and um the people um knew that they were playing with the muslims because the muslims need to answer how his body survived who wrapped up his dead body that means pharaoh's team and his um many members of his administration must have been alive to have buried him given him the process of the funeral embalming process and whatever you see mm -hmm. if this is pharaoh that means his uh, many members of his administration survived you see yes so either way the history doesn't make sense yes um so, um so the thing is and, and then um what do you call it yes let's go through um what do you call it these um um, what do you call it muslim opinions so now the thing is the muslims are divided themselves so it's not like i've just made this up yes um the quran says his body he was saved with his body yes and then at what point did he die is not specified in the quran so now what do we know what do you call it yes some muslims say pharaoh was saved because of his repentance others others say that you know he was under duress and others say he died afterwards they can't make their minds up yeah it's because it's not clear so the quran doesn't have every detail in history it's not an encyclopedia of millions of pages yeah um it's just telling you the story so the so the story says pharaoh survived with his body yes um and now at what point did he die we don't know so now the story of pharaoh surviving is not only in um what do you call it yes in um in the Muslim Quran, this is a big topic in, um, uh, amongst the Orthodox community of Jewish people who study it, that if you go to Exodus um, book 18, yes, you will notice something. Yes, um, you will notice it's got the brackets, Exodus 18, and uh, many, many um, um, Jewish scholars are actually having a similar conversation. They're having the same topic right now. And any Christians, um, you know, are probably debating but not that they care much about the story of Moses the Christians not all of them many of them do but not many it's interesting to note I put it here that Pharaoh survived yeah and the evidence that Pharaoh survived because um chapter 14 verse 28 Exodus informs us that it was the chariots and horsemen of the entire army of Pharaoh and not Pharaoh himself who perished still further evidence can be found by reading chapter 14 verse 17 and I will be glorified through Pharaoh through his entire army through his chariots and his horsemen Egypt will know that I I am it says Hashem here um which means um you know the Lord yes when I'm glorified through Pharaoh his chariots and his horsemen so um the thing is um um, Pharaoh's survival um, is not, uh, and Pharaoh dying is not known in Judaism or even in the Old Testament, as you can see. Um, yeah, because um, um, Egypt pursued and came after them, every horse of Pharaoh, into the midst of the sea. But um, Pharaoh is not mentioned. Yes? Um, you see? Yes? Mm -hmm. So the thing is, um, this has become a major topic of debate. So um, what do you call it? Yes? Let me just show you the entire army of pharaoh it, it turned around and says here is exodus in case people want to check it themselves yes and the thing is many many um religious people in christianity will say hey we don't want to hear other sources um some um, the, uh, that's why um, i don't really want religious people you know talking about these things doing my head in yeah because it's actually doing my head in yeah oh uh, by the way parasha means means uh, parasha uh, uh, yeah or uh, um, means um, part of a biblical book, yes, um, in case some people are wondering in um, Hebrew. So what do you call it, yes? Um, so, uh, the, ah, yeah, here it is. Um, some um, evangelical Christi Christians are even questioning that um, it's not clearly specified. The overwhelming biblical and historical evidence is that he did not die with his army in pursuit of um, the children of Israel. Yes, um, this is um, because they can't find the story of Pharaoh dying in the Bible. Yes, I'm here. Um, what do you call it? Um, here is an official Jewish website, Chabad. Yes, um, um, they they go through many of these historical issues, and even they are questioning. Some say that he drowned. Yes, while others say he he survived. He survived in order 
to retell the story of the miracle of God or God saved him as a sign. The Quran says a similar thing. So now we find a similar thing. So at what point did he die later on? We don't know. So now, the, now um, Pharaoh's, um, what do you call it, his chief architect or his chief, um, you know, policy maker, chief, um, w one of his major chiefs, yes, that's mentioned mysteriously in the Quran. And um, the biblical story is totally different. It turns out says there's a guy called Haman or Human or Haman or Haman. Yes. And um, what do you call it? He's the high priest of Pharaoh. And noticed in ancient Egypt, the high priest or the high priest of Amun Ra, yeah, or Amun, or Amun, or Aman, yes. So there's Haman, Aman, yes. So notice this. So the Quran mentions this guy called Haman, and um, there was um, a message somebody saying, "Hey, what's going on with Haman?" So now, when the Farnese family turned up in Italy, yes, their chief policy that was carried out by all their policymakers was the policy of human. Yes, if people don't know what is human, yes, um, this topic is known as humanism. Yes, that uh, um, Pope Alexandro Farnese of Pharaoh, yes, um, their policy and everything was the formation was humanism, humanism, human, everything to do with human. Everybody, everybody in the Renaissance, the main job was human. Now, if some people haven't read my books to understand humanism, yes, um, the thing is, I can't do anything. Please don't comment on what is humanism in your imagination if you haven't studied humanism during the Renaissance or if you haven't um, read it in or in Alan Tolley's Pemenko's books or my books or anywhere else. I don't want any guesswork. Yes, and humanism I've um, and what was going on during the Renaissance, I've put it in my books, um, The Last Crusade, yes, and parts of it in Skull and Bones and in um, yeah, um, Jerusalem. Um, is in Europe. So the last crusade goes through these issues and skulls and bones and everything. So you, if you haven't read them and you don't know the humanist policy and what's going on with transhumanism today, yes, and how it came from the Renaissance, then, um, you know, please don't invent your own story or own claim and say, hey, what do you call it? David said this, David said this, yeah, or, or that, which it doesn't make sense. Well, anyway, um, um, the thing is, um, humanism was the main policy dur during um, the Renaissance, yeah, in the 16th century. Yes, and um, what do you call it? Yes. Um, so, who was humanism for? It wasn't for for um, the average person on the road. Yes, it was for the mega upper class. Yes, it was for it was the script for the classical skills for the elite males, um, etc. In theatre and in society, in everywhere. Yeah. Uh, humanism was the main thing, and humanism comes from the word human or haman. So, um, um, what do you call it? Yes. And the thing is, modern humanism is something else. What they're teaching us in school and some of the nice beliefs and everything. This is not the humanism of the elite. Now, the elite see humanism in a different way. Yes, I'm going to go through Machiavelli in a little minute, and you'll think, ah, now I can see. Um, what's going on. There is the humanism that they teach us in philosophy, sociology, and in social studies and other things in um, school and in humanities. But this is not the official humanism that they teach us. Yes. So the thing is Farnese. Yes. Um, the, the Italian cardinal, diplomat, and in their family, the military popes and everything. He was the pope. Yeah. He was no humanism. And then the thing is, they're saying doctrines, this and that, to confuse you. But the, but they were no humanists at all. They didn't care about anything. Yes. So what? So now um, the thing is, um, what do you call it here? Yeah? Um, all of these people were humanists. Um, Giovanni de Medici, Lorenzo the Magnificent, you know, Lorenzo, and all of these people. All of these are humanists in Italy. Um, Lorenzo, I like his name. Yes. Um, so the thing is, they all had the education of human. Now, humanist is an English word. Let's use the global word because, um, you know, in Germany, they're not going to speak English. It's human. So they're studying something called human or Haman or the chief policy of Pharaoh or Firaun. And then um, Firaun is there and he's learning um, human, whatever this human is. Yes. And all of them, they're just studying human, human, human. or or humanism or whatever it is. So now um, the thing is, let's go back to the Quran again. And with the invented vowels and diacritic 
pronunciation system. Um, the thing is, um, what do you call it? Yes, Western scholars. Western scholars are now claiming human or Haman is unknown to ancient Egyptian history. Yes, and what do you call it? This human or Haman is mentioned in the Quran um, several times, depending on the pronunciation. Heman, Haman, Homun, Humun, Hamun, Hamen Ra, Amen or whatever, Hamen. Yeah, so he is mentioned in the Quran um, six times, and he's supposed to be the chief policymaker of Pharaoh, one of the major chiefs. So now um, the thing is, when you go through it, and you go through the, um, different Middle Eastern languages, including Hebrew, which was made from Middle Eastern dialects only 100 years ago, that what we will see is that um, the name Haman comes from the verb Aman in many uh, Middle Eastern dialects, as well as Hebrew, yes? Um, comes from Aman or Aman Ra, Aman Ra. Now Aman, yeah, the Ra um, is something else. Um, it's a long story, but Aman, one of the gods, yes. And um, the thing is, um, if we go through it in the Middle Eastern dialects, um, sometimes it's spelled Haman or Haman or human that we will even see. That um, what do you call it? They've tried to mix history together, saying the Elamite or Middle Eastern god somewhere. Yes, there is this god called human or Haman. Yes, and then they've invented the rest of it to mix it with the Babylonians. But, but anybody who's read my books and um, watched the previous videos, Babel or Baba El or B Babylon is actually Cairo. Yes, so now this Haman and this Babylonian history is fake and they've just moved it from, from Cairo, from Egypt. So now even in English, um, they give a bogus history of this word human, where it come from. Yes. Um, for humanist or human, humanism, but the main thing that we do know is that it came after the French invasion. They're going to say the French invasions in the 10th century, others, yeah, it looks like it was in the 17th century, William of Orange, 1688, fake date. So it's from the word Haman or Umain or uh, uh, belonging to a human, so uh, or things like that. So it's the same word, whether it's Haman, Human or Haman or Hemen or whatever, or Aman, yes? So, so, now the, so now the Quran says two things. It says that the, that the Pharaoh was Firaun, and it says his chief policymaker was um, a guy called Human or Haman. So now what people don't know, this is going to be the biggest shock ever, even to you, Raphael. Yes, you're going to be shocked in a minute to understand the war that's going on between Moses and Pharaoh, because they don't explain it. Yes, what they've done, the, Egypt, the ancient Egyptians were humanists. They were naturalistic and polytheistic in their faith. They were humanistic in that they worshipped men. Do you see? It was a society of humanism. That's why when it's called Bab Elian, it's plural. And that's why when they say their prophet, Nabilian, or, or um, the prophet of the gods, Yes, it was one of their mythological characters. They mixed several characters together. And somebody said, how could David talk about him, but he didn't exist? <laughs> Don't worry about this. Yes, um, I, I, um, that person is embarrassing. It just shows, it just shows um, uh, um, that they didn't know. But anyway, let's check where this word human came from. Yes, this word human or haman, it came from Persuado Greek. They can't make their mind of what Persuado means. Or basically this word, human came from egypt that's where the greek was spoken we can't find ancient greece and yes if anyone's going to turn around and say uh, another comment that's why i've turned around and said hey people yes by now if you continuously keep commenting and the thing is and you haven't been through it i've written a book about this that ancient greece did not exist Yes, and that the Greek language and everything was uh, is actually an old form of Arabic that's been modified and invented in Egypt by the people of the Middle East. That Pharaoh and the boys, they came from the Middle East. Now, if you're not going to, if you don't want to read my books, read Fomenko's. If you don't want to read his, then do some research yourself. You'll find it. They call it Coin Greek. It's not Greek. Same like, it's same like turning around saying the Chinese speak English. Yeah? Um, no, it's English. It came from e England. Yes, many Chinese who do speak English. Yes, so it's not Greek, it came from Egypt. Yes, that's the thing that people don't understand. So now the word human and Haman, once again, it comes from Egypt. So now the thing is, what is humanism? Yes, now I'm going to go 
um, through this, through the through human, and the thing is human, um, during the Renaissance, um, it was expressed through statues and art of Greek and Roman art and the statues of the pharaohs and explaining these things. And what do you call it? Yes. If anybody who studies what humanism is, humanism, yes, was Pharaoh and Haman. It is the conflicts between the religion of the Bible, not the Bible. He's put the word Bible. It's the religion of Moses and its rival, the religion of humanism. It is that is what the war is about. Pharaoh and Haman, or, or Pharaoh and, and Human, against Moses and his one God. Now I will. Now the thing is, it, it do, at first it, it's it, you think what? Okay. Now um, what do you call it? Yes. Um, the thing is um, the identity. Ah, the identity of the Pharaoh who fought against Moses has not. Has um uh, has not been um found because they've fabricated Egyptian her history. Yes, that they're saying it's a it's a matter of dispute. Who this pharaoh was of Firan? So the Quran says his his name or his title was was Firan. So the thing is um what do you call it? Yes, um what do you call it? Yes, and um this is very well known that um what do you call it? That the religion of ancient Egypt is basically humanism. Yes. Um, and its relevance, or, or Haman, the system was was um, yeah um, was the Haman system, or Aman, Aman Ra, Amon, Amon. That's where the word human came from. But the, of course, they're going to say it came from France. Then it came from the Greek that was in Egypt. It's actually from the god Amon, or from this man called Haman, who was the chief advisor, one of the chief advisors or chief policymaker of. The Pharaoh called Firan, and only the Quran mentions this story, nowhere else. This doesn't mean that, um, what do you call it, the Quran is some super book. It's just restating a history that's already there. So now the humanism of, of ancient Egypt, let's go through this. This is well known that um, uh, um, people who are looking at, if you defined um, um, the history in um, philosophical terms and gave it a title, Yes, here it is again. You could buy books on it. The conflict between Moses and Pharaoh was a conflict between the religion of, of God. Yes, and Moses and um, humanism. I'm not going to say the Bible because um, the Bible was written after. Yes. So now the thing is, what do you call it? Yes. Anatoly Fomenko. Yes. Points out that, um, what do you call it? Yes. That um, ancient Egypt was during the Middle Ages. Yeah that um, it was still there up until about 1700s. And then after this, Islam came in the 16th, 17th century. Yes, and um, uh, um, the real kingdom uh, lasted up till the 1700s. Yes, so when there is the Firan, who is in Rome, yes, who is the Pope, they still had the same system. They had colonies in other places. It's actually two different sides who are fighting. So when we've got the Tataria in Moscow, and many people have made these Tataria groups, but nobody or hardly anybody wants to mention this. Yes, yeah, they're all going to talk about Tataria and the war, yes, and the war between, what do you call it, yes, Napoleon or the French or Firan or Firanish or French, yes, um, fighting, um, what do you call it, yes, um, with the Tatars in Russia, yes, and and um, um, what you will notice is that the Tatars are actually Muslims. People aren't going to bring this up. All these Tataria groups that say, "Hey, Tataria was great." Hang on, it is well known that it's too difficult to hide it that they were Muslims. It's a fact. So soon they're going to say they're Mongols. I ain't seen no Mongol Tatars. I've been to over 50 cities in Russia and many, many villages. Yeah, the Tatars, they're all European. Half of them look like Slavs, half look like Germanic. Yeah, I ain't seen no Mongol Tatars. Yeah, the Crimean Tatars are something else. I'm talking about these Russian Tatars. Oh, another thing. Yes, if you haven't read my books, then I can't do anything, but I do specify and I make it clear of the suspicious history. Yes of um, Napoleon Bonaparte, and this is in Napoleon did not exist as a real character, that, um, what do you call it, Napoleon invades Moscow, but the R Russian capital was Petersburg, or named after Petra, or Peter, or the father, 
Yes, um, what do you call it? Yes, instead of going to Petersburg, which is around the corner from Poland, when Napoleon had his armies, he goes all the way to Moscow and uh, yeah, to fight. And he's saying, I want to stop this. He invaded Moscow because he wanted to stop Petersburg from trading with England. Does that make sense to you, Raphael? Not at all. No, it seemed like I'm trying to say, I want to stop ships from going to New York City. So we're going to invade Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we want to stop the British. Yes, from trading with France. Instead of blocking the English Channel, let's send our army to the North Pole. That's how pathetic this story is. Yes. So the thing is, if um, people are going to turn around and talk about Napoleon, yes, um, you know, Give me a break. Yeah, this time I'm saying this because I've noticed there's many comments that are unnecessary that by now people should have um, woke up. So now um, the thing is, um, what do you call it? Professor Anatoly Fomenko, he goes through this and in previous videos we've gone through to show the Alma guest and the code 19 in the Alma guest and the fake, fake, um, what do you call it? Datings and everything. Fomenko show, goes through the datings of Ptolemy and all these other things and all these horoscopes. And they all show that Egypt existed in the Middle Ages. Now what Fomenko also shows and other researchers have shown is that the story of Abraham and Sarah, according to Western theology, yes, actually shows another duplicate of the story of Pharaoh and the Exodus from Egypt. Yes, um, the early days of Abraham, and he was struggling with either a Pharaoh or another Pharaoh or something like this. So now um, let, let, let's um, go through this. So humanism now in Europe during the Renaissance, then we can understand where the world is today. Yes. In this video, I'm hoping people will figure it out now at last where we are today, if you watch the previous two videos. So now humanism, yes, during the Renaissance, what they did was they gave rebirth and they're making all these statues. Yes, they're making all these statues of Greek statues, ancient Egyptian statues and everything. And they're putting them around, around um, Italy and Europe, everywhere the armies of the Vatican and their allies are going. And they've invented the history saying ancient Greece existed. Don't you know? It was there a thousand years before us. You know, ancient Rome, yeah, it disappeared. Now in the Middle Ages, we found it a thousand years later. Yes. Oh, by the way, I didn't say Abraham and Sarah were actually fighting a pharaoh, but in Western history, it portrays it that way. So now, according to the Quran, to do with Abraham, there is um, this story that, um, what do you call it? Yeah, that is not very well known in um, Western history. Now, the Quran turned around and says, um, what do you call it? Yes. Um, no, I've already sent you this. Let me just show you what the Quran says. Now, the Quran story is very important because then we will see ancient Egypt and the humanism yeah, around the world and the war between human or Haman and humanism and um, what is known as the followers of Moses. Now, the Quran says that Abraham was breaking statues and then he turned on and, and then um, when they asked him, um, um, I think it was um, his father or somebody, I don't know the exact details, but it says when they asked him who broke the statue, he left one statue and he, he didn't break all the others, you know, like in a big museum or a big a big cathedral or somewhere, you could say like um, the Vatican Cathedral, there must have been men, many statues there or something. Yeah, I'm not sure what the story is, but anyway, he turned around and said, ask that statue there, there's one left. <laughs> Maybe that one knows who broke all the others. And he was trying to show these statues have no value and they can't do anything. So now let's go through what is the, what is the policy of um, humanism. The end game of humanism is actually transhumanism. Yes. Yeah. And the transhuman, transhumanism, we're slowly getting there with the transgenders and all these other agendas and the drags, drag queen races and everything. You know, 20 years ago, it was just... Um, what do you call it? It was just um, um, the, um, the lady boy pageants, but now we've got um, all these other things like drag races have become very common now on television and they're bringing them out all over the world. Yes, like, um, yeah, so transhuman is going to be the future. Um, well, this is what they're um, hoping, yeah? So um, this, is the, the, this is the plan. Now the drag stage is part one, but as man merges, with machinery, yes. And the thing is, they try and say God created man. So the transhumanism, they put it in the Greek 
Old Testament that was um, written in Greek. They 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 blame and they say Jewish rabbis did this, but there's no evidence of this. But transhumanism, the end game is that God created man, and um, what do you call it? Yes, the world's population is too high. Man could live for a thousand years with machinery. Yes, therefore man does not need woman. Yes. Because um, the thing is, if you could live a thousand years, you don't need children. Therefore, there is only man and man. You understand? Therefore, a man is a man as well as a man is a woman. Are you beginning to understand? Yes, that people thought the humanists were actually empowering women. No. Um, um, other people turn around and say it broke down the family system. And um, uh, now men don't re need women. Fast food. Cook yourself. So many single men. Yes, and then you don't need women for a man because he's going to meet somebody, um, a man who looks like a woman, who's modified his body. That, um, uh, people don't know these things. But um, the thing is, when you go through uh, many of these um, humanist documents and um, um, the interpretation from the Old Testament, God created man, then um, the thing is, you'll soon realize this. So the transhumanism movement of uh, mixing um, humans, animals, and everything else. Um, what do you call it? Yes. Um, it, with technology is going to go further. And um, transhumanism, yeah, you can trace it as far back, and it was already in used in what they call ancient Egypt, which was the Middle Ages, but not so long ago. Yes. Of um, what do you call it? You know, transplanting other things, moving body parts, trying to connect them with other things so that humans could live forever. Yes. So, so that was the purpose. So now Moses was the opposite. Yes. Moses turned around and said, what do you call it? Yes. You're going to die. Yes. And your life is here. Here is temporary. Yes. Make your life better, but don't make your whole purpose. Yes. What do you call it? So transhumanism, people have written about it. Best selling authors here. I've sent you here, you know, ancient Egypt and the Egyptians invented, um, you know, m um, many things. That, um, and it was based on transhumanism or humanism. So now the philosophy of transhumanism, let's go to Pico de, de la Mirandola um, in, a, what do you call it, at the time of Faran or the family of Faranetti. Yes, during the um, Renaissance. And what do we see about um, 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 the, um, of, um, Pico de la Mar um, Mirandola?